So what I would like to do with this video is to give you uh, just another view of uh, this whole uh, question of how the scientist's mind, scientist's mind works in regard to this whole thing called the scientific method. So uh, Gail Bogdan's uh, video was, was great. It kind of went through the basic ideas in a very co conceptual way. I just wanted to give you another example here. Uh, now, so for those of you who have lived in Southern California for some time, you've probably experienced a red tide event. Uh, the red tide is um, a period during which we have this uh, a bloom of phytoplankton. Those are microscopic organisms that uh, color the sea a, a brownish or reddish color. And uh, what ha when this typically happens, we have um, a lot of interesting things go on. There's a, a, a bioluminescence that occurs um, uh, that you can see during the night. What happens is that if you go to the beach uh, at the night, uh, during the night, during a period of red tide, you can see this uh, bright blue uh, bioluminescence occur where the waves crash or where your footsteps walk uh, are, are left, your, your footprints behind you in the wet sand. So uh, another thing that typically happens during the red tide periods is uh, somebody always notices that there are some uh, seals or sea lions that are dying. And uh, the question is always raised, well, what's causing the deaths of the seals and sea lions during these periods of red tide? So uh, here's the question that we're going to be asking. And, and, uh, and again, I want to follow the, uh, the lead let, uh, left by Gail um, and, and remind you of a couple of things. Uh, first of all, when we talk about a scientific hypothesis, it's not the same thing as a scientific question. Our question that we might be wanting to answer may actually be, what is the cause of these harbor seal and sea lion deaths during the periods of the red tide? But that's not the same thing as a hypothesis. A hypothesis actually says, this is what causes it. And then uh, once you have this hypothesis, you could uh, create a, uh, an experiment or some kind of methodology to validate that hypothesis or to uh, invalidate the hypothesis. And by investigating it, we can either uh, give the thumbs up to the hypothesis saying that it has support or not. So I want to give you a, a, a good example of this. Obviously, during a red tide, if you see dead uh, harbor seals or harbor seals that are on the verge of dying or very sick, the hypothesis that immediately pops into your mind would be this. Uh, the, the seal deaths are caused by whatever it is that causes the red tide. And in this particular case, we know what that is. It's uh, a form of phytoplankton, or uh, uh, actually it's a dinoflagellate. That's the name of the kind of organism that it is. It's the kind of phytoplankton and the species. The genus of phytoplankton is lingulodinium. It's so it's, it's a long word, but um, basically what that is telling us is that there's this a microscopic alga-like thing, lingulodinium, that is in hu such huge abundance during these periods of red tide that it causes the sea to turn red. All right, and if you see that these seals are dying off during the periods of uh, during these periods of red tide, the uh, obviously this would be the most um, the most logical hypothesis to uh, to raise. Right, so uh, call this hypothesis one. Now, uh, if if this is your only hypothesis, then you'd set up an experiment to uh, somehow validate it. Maybe you could find some uh, chemical that is present in lingulodinium that is the uh, that is uh, toxic in some ways and you could look for a higher abundance of that chemical in the carcasses of the sea lions that are dying okay uh, but but realize that you hardly ever go into an endeavor like this with only one hypothesis uh, you might notice that I've left a whole lot of space underneath hypothesis one and so let's look at some other hypotheses that you could be using uh, you could be investigating as you're setting up this overall endeavor of trying to figure out what the causes of death are for these seals and sea lions during the periods of red tide. Okay. Uh, another thing that you really have to consider is the possibility that maybe um, these uh, these sea lions and seals, they die pretty much every year. There's some mortality that occurs every year. And if you just happen to see the seals dying during a period of red tides, if there's there's um, a tendency for people just to get alarmed and say, well, yeah, the seal deaths are um, 
are somehow tied to the red tides, where, where in real fact there might be actually nothing related to the red tide uh, causing the seal deaths. It's just a matter of uh, seals dying every year. And it's that we're just noticing them more during the periods where there's something else going on like the red tide. So this one would be relatively easy to document. You could, uh, you know, people keep relatively good records of uh, seal mortalities or seal strandings on a year-to-year -year basis. And if you were to, uh, if you were to find that the incidences, the, the frequency of seal strandings, the uh, either beaching or the dead seals are about the same. Uh, about the same frequency during the red tide years as during the non-red tide years, that would be kind of like a good validation of hypothesis two, uh, which basically says that seal deaths are no different uh, during the red tides that, than they are during the non-red tide years. And if that's the case, then there's really nothing else that you need to investigate. Um, there's no justification. There's no uh, validation to the idea that there's any link between seal deaths and red tides. But let's say you're able to validate the whole idea. I mean, I think this you know, this might be the first thing you'd want to do if you're going to uh, investigate the question of whether seal deaths are actually caused with red tides. Uh, but uh, but again, this is not these are not the only two hypotheses you could um, posit. And maybe the idea that okay, well maybe these uh, seal deaths are not caused by the red tide organism, um, but the the bloom the uh, the red tide itself is caused by something that's triggered um, that, tr that triggers this algal bloom. The, uh, this superabundance of lingulodinium is, uh, is probably going to be triggered by some type of environmental factor. And in a lot of cases, algal blooms are caused by some type of pollution. And so uh, another hypothesis might be that the cause of the red tide might be some type of agricultural or industrial runoff that results in the red tide, and that runoff is also the same kind of toxic uh, event that results in the sea lion deaths. Okay, this is actually a different hypothesis than saying that the red tide organism is the cause of the sea lion death. And so you could investigate in a different way. You're actually setting up a different prediction here. You might not uh, be looking, you might not be expecting to find, if this is the case, any red tide organism related chemicals inside of the sea lion carcasses. You might find some industrial pollutants in the sea lion carcasses that are also implicated in the causes of the red tide event. Okay, and uh, this is going to go on for quite a while. Quite a while. Uh, here's another hypothesis. I think it's perfectly, uh, perfectly reasonable too. Uh, during a red tide, things happen chemically in the water that may, that might make it difficult for the uh, for the uh, for the food that the sea lions eat, uh, the anchovies and the sardines, they might be detrimentally affected by the red tide event. And if the uh, sea lion's food or is declining during the red tide, that's going to obviously make it difficult for the sea lions to uh, survive themselves. So uh, maybe this might predict um, a pattern in which the causes of death for the sea lions uh, might be uh, starvation. We might be looking for sea lions in very poor nutritional conditions during the periods of the red tide. And that's that's what causes them to have uh, such low fitness. Okay. Uh, hypothesis five is something that's kind of fun to think about. Well, maybe um, well, during these red tide events, the uh, the water gets a lot more murky, and that might be to the advantage of some predators like sharks. And so maybe the sharks are able to take advantage of these low visibility conditions occurring during the red tide to have a higher success rate in killing the sea lions. And uh, this you know, obviously there are predictions you might make here. Um, if we have these sea lion strandings, are the sea lions uh, showing some type of physical uh, physical injury caused by sharks? Are there large bites taken out of these carcasses and so forth? And that might be another type of prediction that would be testable uh, through um, a, a relatively straightforward um, investigation. Hypothesis six is one that actually comes up uh, as I actually think about the uh, kinds of investigations that have happened in the past. Uh, when uh, the last time I heard about this being uh, investigated, uh, what we found out was that there was something else 
uh, that was causing a higher than normal incidence of sea lion deaths during the red tide. And it was, um, it, it was, it was kind of an interesting investigation. What we found was that the sea lions and the sea harbor seals that were dying were, uh, were intoxicated. They were, uh, they, they were um, suffering from a toxicity caused by another type of alga, but it wasn't the kind of alga that causes the sea, uh, the, the red tide itself. It wasn't lingulodinium. It was actually caused by another type of phytoplankton called uh, pseudonychia, and the, uh, the uh, neurotoxin that was resulting um, from, uh, that was causing the sea lion deaths was a neurotoxin called um, domoic acid. And uh, th that was a real eye-opener because it was kind of uh, quite unexpected. And I want you to be, uh, just be aware that a lot of times these unexpected causes are, uh, are sometimes what turns out to be the, uh, the actual uh, causality underlying a particular kind of event that you're trying to investigate. Okay, so, so this is kind of like a good exercise in what we mean by a hypothesis. Uh, remember, it's not the question. We're not the, the hypothesis is not saying what is the cause of harbor seal and sea lion deaths during the red tides. A hypothesis actually sell, tells me some type of narrative explanation for it that we can then uh, investigate using some type of scientific methodology. Okay, uh, in all cases, we're looking uh, after a hypothesis is stated, we're looking for some type of uh, protocol to either validate or refute the validity of that hypothesis, and therein lies the scientific method.